Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger, and welcome to my disappearing mic and to Dare to Dream. (laughs) Oh, I'm so happy to be with you. And I have been waiting for this conversation. A lot of you know that I've been on the shamanic path for lo these many years and how much indigenous cultures mean to me and that I speak all over the world. Personally, I speak about shamanism and extraterrestrials and where they meet and why the message. Frankly, the message always from the elders has been so important. They were very dismissed people. However, hmm, they win because they've always known the truth about our connection to the cosmos, our connection to the earth, to all of nature, all of beings, animals, plants, rivers, sacred mountains, And really, there are so many inherent secrets for how we can write the course of humanity and the earth. So what does all that mean to that end? Ah, today I am speaking live with a Mayan elder, Elizabeth Arahu. And we're going to be focusing on the Maya calendar, the profound themes of divine feminine energy, and the fulfillment of ancient prophecies. Stick around for that amazing conversation. This show has won many awards. I've been on air for over 17 years. I've decided next year for the 18th year, I am having a celebration. The show has won three talk radio positive change awards. Listed in Welp Magazine is one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to. COV award, COVR award for best podcast. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and excess consciousness. They do energy work. If you'd like to be a facilitator or take a class, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com. I have a free gift for you. It is a star seed report and video. You can go to debbie-inger.com slash starseed. This includes a deep dive into 19 different star seeds so you can find out all about your gifts, your strengths, your weakness, and where you are from. Learn your galactic roots in this mind-blowing free gift. And it's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash starseed. Also, news on the front A new shamanic class is opening, and this one specifically is about animal spirit medicine. I'm going to take you down the path so you can become intimate with several different animals, and you may not be aware of the kind of inherent wisdom and lessons that they carry. Each week, we'll be deep diving and doing rituals and some kind of journey meditations around each animal so you can gain their wisdom and what they have come here to show you and help you with on your path. I am so excited. I am so excited to lead this and for the people who are showing up to experience it. Go to debbie-inger.com slash shaman. You don't have too long to sign up for this. So it's D-E-B-B-I, D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash shaman. And enjoy this profound journey in the sacred mystical realm of animal beings. And the last thing, and I'll go more deeply at the end, so stay till the end, is about the Galactic Origins cruise coming up. We have some spectacular speakers, seven days at sea, going to the Yucatan, Belize, Cozumel, Tulum, Costa Maya. And one of the phenomenal speakers on this cruise is the woman I'm about to introduce you to. And if you'd like to learn more about that cruise so you can join Elizabeth and I, both speaking, go to debbie-inger.com slash cruise. Well, my guest, Elizabeth Arahu, was born in El Salvador. She left the country in 1959 and lives in Guatemala, where the Maya tradition and ancient ways are alive. She is a member of the Consejo 
Maya de El Salvador, and for more than 20 years worked closely with the National Council of Elders Maya. And after the passing of many great elders of wisdom due to an advanced age, she is guided to do more work on her own. Elizabeth says, this is the time of the woman and we must walk forward. And with that, I welcome the amazing Elizabeth Arahu to Dare to Dream. <laughs> so great to have you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Debbie. And thank you for that warm welcome. Um, I'm going to start as a, it is customary in our tradition to start with a little prayer. Please. And our prayers just come from, they are spontaneous. Okay. So. Uh, you, did you say montaneous, the mountains? Expo, spontaneous. Oh, from wait, the wait. moment. Oh, <laughs> spontaneous. Okay. I Thank mean, you. they just come, whatever happens at the moment we don't read from we don't learn it from books so i'm gonna call our ancestors o sakol bitol halom kaholom o grandmother of the light grandmother of the clarity grandfather of the light grandfather of the clarity two three times father two three times grandfather i give you thanks for giving me one more day of life. I give you thanks for this precious moment here with my brothers and sisters. We have gathered here through the energies of the day of today. That is a canil. Canil is the seed, the beginning of life. It's the semen of the animal. It's the semen of human. It's the seed of our plants that provide our food for us. I give you thanks, Father, for this moment, for the rain that came to nourish our crops, to nourish our seed. It's also the seed of our tradition that it was buried to protect it from the invasion. But our ancestors say, my children, don't forget this knowledge. Mm -hmm. Don't let this wisdom go to waste or be forgotten because the day will come where you will have to share it. And here we are, that time is now. Give us light, give us wisdom so we can dialogue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That was absolutely beautiful. Thank you. I'd like here at the start, if you don't mind, to explain what it is to be an elder. I think everybody understands it has something to do with age, but I'm not referring to that because I think it's so much more deep than that. Will you explain what it is for you to be an elder in your culture? Well, to be an elder is not getting old. It has to have some experience in life. You know, we have, uh, uh, in our tradition, we say the first seven years is of uh, childhood. It's a time of innocence. The second, uh, the second uh, seven years, from seven to 14, 15, are moments where you just enjoyment, uh, experience their emotions, you know, that you meet a, a boy or you meet a girl or you have a, it's all joy. But then it comes another time when you, the other seven years, when you start facing life, like you have to work, you have to, you know, find jobs. There are a lot of challenges that come. And the next seven years, are the test in life. You know, you experience maybe a divorce, maybe your parents parents die. And so you go through all that. And then uh, when you reach the 52, you become an elder, but you haven't, you have to be someone with some wisdom, with some experience, with, uh, you know, 
it to show that you have been working for uh, humanity. It's not just to be, you know, an elder that uh, has done nothing in life, and they are become like they are like children, <laughs> just enjoying life with no commitments of any kind. And so you are not that elder, <laughs> the one without commitments. You have a big <laughs> commitment. What would you say your mission is? Well, you know, I used to work like uh, anyone else. And then one day they say, this is enough. And they send me back to here to with the elders. They said, you have a mission. And my mission is, I think, I think it's been to pass the message of the ancestors. Uh, by the way, it's an oral tradition. I'm not an academic person. And it, what I speak about is about what my ancestors or my teachers, they have taught me. Beautiful. Tradition have... that has come from centuries. centuries. Ah, that was my question. How far back something like this goes? So at least centuries, maybe even tens or thousands of years. Oh, since the absolutely. Of yeah. Absolutely. From the time of creation. Mm. Uh, well, I want to just say here at the start that in my very interesting journey, which I never in a million years thought would be here, always a deeply spiritual person, but uh, much to my surprise, I had a very unusual experience many years ago. It had to do with plant wisdom uh, and the divine and uh, the divine coming and doing a mantra over me. I didn't understand what she was talking about, but she was very insistent that I learn something about myself, which set me out on a, from confusion on a path to understand more. And along that path, including past life regressions and many other things to help me unearth what this information about me was and why it mattered and what to do with it. One of the many things is that I did a past life regression and saw that I was, had been a Mayan priestess in a temple and a leader of my people. And then along the line much later, which was amazing confirmation for me. I had had my DNA done, which I found rather boring and predictable. And I found another company that did, uh, does genomes where you send your raw DNA data, and then you can get really specific as to your inception, where you really come from, all of this. And so amongst some very interesting pieces of information, when I asked, what about indigenous? What about native? Do I have any of this? It came back, the chromosomes, to be specific, that I am 99.4% genetically chromosomes, genomes, Mayan, and 0.4% Native American. I'm like, boof. This is amazing. So I have been on a shamanic path. I work with shamans around the world. I teach it now. And uh, this work means a lot to me. And so I want to thank you first that I can speak to somebody like you because you're the first that I can even dip my toe modern wise into the Mayan culture. So first, let me give take a breath and just see if you want to say anything to all of that. Well, uh, we believe in reincarnation. And this is what you're speaking about. This is an, a, an example of that. You know, when we leave this uh, earth, we, we don't believe in death as an end. It's the body gets old, or the body gets hurt, or something happens to our physical body, and it goes to rest. But the spirit, the spirit doesn't die. And then at some point where the right person is, the spirit comes back. And I think that's what you're talking about. And it can be born uh, in any place of the world. You know, if, if the Mayans were here in Guatemala and you were born someplace else, well, the, the spirit has no boundaries. 
It has no boundaries. So, and it's very true what you say. And uh, very profound, the resonance, the truth I feel, and the passion I have about all of this. So I know enough to follow energy. And that's what I do. And so getting into these amazing subjects, Elizabeth, there is a sacred book in creation called the Popul Va, if I said that right, the Popul Va, Popul, which describes yeah. this, this profound silence and this stillness at the beginning of creation. How does that kind of initial state of the universe influence the Mayan understanding of existence and the role of humanity in the cosmos? Well, um, you know, the creation, uh, let, let's, say, let's say I'm going to start with uh, uh, the consuetudinary law. It says, we were created to worship and to revere our creator, to uh, take care of Mother Earth and in, uh, with everything that lives on her, and also to uh, uh, obey the divine laws. When uh, we were created, um, it's, it's like we were created in a certain way, but then it comes the co-creation that is our responsibility. That's why there are different traditions, although they all had the gear to the same thing, to the origin, but each one they do is, they do it in a different way because they, that is the uh, uh, creativity co-creation of everyone. I know you've mentioned that we have, oh, sorry. Yeah, and we have forgotten this connection with Mother Earth. We have, we have forgotten to take care of Mother Earth. In some communities here uh, in the countryside, you know, the farmers, the, the elders, uh, the young people have forgotten some of those things, but their connection with the earth Look, uh, when they are going to plant a field of a cornfield, they prepare the land, then they send the children, they give them candies, and they send them to play. Then this brings sweetness to the earth because they're playing all over the ground. Oh, and then the food will be with joy and, uh, and uh, you know, with uh, sweetness and more nutrition. We have the Sikhs from India, you know the Sikhs? When, when they uh, present themselves in, uh, or share festivals, at festivals, their theme is to give food. And you can go to the kitchen where they are preparing the food, food for everyone. You know, they are chanting. They are chanting while they are doing the food. So the food absorbs all that energy. And this is a connection of the air, you know, the voice, the air with our food. Yes. And we have lost all those connections. Yes. If uh, when the people go in the countryside, you know, um, they before they start working with their tools, they blow in their hands before touching the tools. Then they say they don't get blisters in their hands. Or What's blow the into their hands? Is it a go, transmission or a prayer? It is a prayer. Mm. It is a blessing. And mm. You're blessing the, what is going to give you your living. Yes, same is in the, the um, same is when you are uh, having a, a, a company, you know, and you have to cook, cook for the company. You blow your hands before touching the food, mm. and then the food is enough for everybody. Wow, I we mean, have lost. I'll give you another example. Yeah, I'm just feeling very, the implications, even in the work I do, how I can use this. In so many places, you know, when I speak, I can have people 
do this in the audience to literally bless the room and each other collectively for what we're about to create for the next hour. I mean, there's See, so the many connection is very simple. It's, yeah, they are they are things that we don't think about it. You know, very very simple. I'll give you one. This one I was with the Grand Elder of Guatemala. We were in Siberia. And we had never been there, and we didn't know any of the people there. And one day, they took us to a field. Uh, it was way in the, you know, far away from the cities, from any town. And there were some petroglyphs, and they wanted us to see the petroglyphs. So the girl, we were six of us. The girl that uh, our guide, it was an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. They crossed, the, it was like a circle. And uh, and they cross to the back end of the circle. And we were in the back because the grand elder was walking slow, you know, connecting with the earth. So he stopped at the entrance. And then the people, the other four, they were calling us, come here. This is what we want to show you this. Come here. And the elder was all into himself didn't pay attention to the call. He went to a rock, put his head in the rock mm. like that. And then he moved about three yards away from the rock and started digging. And then he said, now when he finished digging, he said, you come here. He told the other four, you come here. And he says, can you explain me what this means what is uh you know how this came about and she started talking about the circle it was a circle of rocks big rocks and then the girl says oh I, they say that they came from that mountain far away that it was an explosion and they came they came running down and then he says look over here he had found a glyph and he says here is the story of this place. You see the connection with the earth. And then, uh, and then uh, he said there was a lake. It was a, like a volcano under a lake that it was an explosion and throw the, you know, the rocks away and they came in a circle. Mm -hmm. She was all excited and surprised. And she says, I never knew this. But I just want to say the connection, you know, with. Yes, when you realize we are all one, there is no separation, there is consciousness in everything. You can actually have, euphemistically speaking, relations, conversations, gain knowledge and wisdom from all these aspects that we overlook. And to add to what you're saying, Elizabeth, I know in the Peruvian culture in the Andes, the, the Inca, the Quero people, they use terraced farming. And they also use permaculture, meaning they rotate crops. So they eat, always keep the soil rich, fertile, that it can always grow crops instead of decimating the soil like we often do here in the United States. You grow so much and then there's nothing left to grow on. So these ideas of honoring the earth uh, from which our food comes from amongst other things is very important. I know that you have mentioned that the creator sent four prophets from the stars after humanity's persistent pleas for purpose. Can you elaborate on the teachings the prophets brought and how they shaped the Mayan tradition and those spiritual practices? Well, it was because of uh, this generation, when they came, that generation, they were always asking and, and pleading, what is our purpose here? What are we doing here? He said, who created us? What's, uh, they didn't know anything about themselves. And then that's when creators sent them the four prophets. And they started teaching them and teaching them uh, how to work with, uh, with precious stones, how to work with metals, what foods you can eat here. You have plenty of foods in it. 
and uh, uh, and uh, everything they took. The day came when uh, that was after who knows how many, many years, you know, had passed. They were old already. And then one day they say they gathered people around. And he said that they went to a mountain here. It says, uh, in this mountain, because they were asking, we are cold. You know, we want to see, and we are in darkness. We want to see light. So that's when the elders were kind of old. They were already, uh, one day they say, well, let's go to this mountain. And then they say, we're going, pleading for the sun to be seen, for the light to come. And that's when they did the first ceremony. When they felt that they, after chanting for hours, day and night, they went into the mountain, into the forest, and each one of them gathered certain uh, a type of uh, sap from trees, from different trees, to prepare an offering. There comes, like when you receive something, there is always an exchange. You have to give thanks, you know. And so they gathered these materials, and they waited for the sun. Then uh, they started working on the calendars because with the sun, they could start measuring time, measuring, and they started working on the calendars. One day when they were old, they came to this, they gathered all the people, and then they say, you know, we, our time is up. They say, we have taught you everything we had to teach, to teach you. Our job is done. We are finished, we are going back. And then somebody asked, uh, they were surprised and somebody asked, but where do you come from? First he, he says, well, from that little bunch of stars and that's where we are going back. And then there is more to that because sometime later on, they returned to Egypt. And in Egypt, they were named Karamayas and established the tradition in Egypt. Then they went back again after finishing their teachings there, they came back to India. And then they were called Nagamayas. And again, they established the tradition there and went back and return according to the glyphs that the Grand Elder had, you know, they return one fourth time around Cambodia. And they did the same. In all those four places, our cultures are very similar. And See, so you all... said, I just want to make sure I get this right. They came to the Mayans, they went to Egypt, they went to India, and what was the fourth place where it, the cultures around, around Cambodia, Cambodia, and some of the neighborhood. No, and do you know from what planet? The... But uh, but all those places you see, the, all those places have pyramids. All those places honor the serpent. Serpent is wisdom. You know that, like in Egypt, they had the coral. And it's even in, you know, then uh, in uh, India, they have the cobra. And then in the other places, they have the seven-headed serpent. Right. And then it sounds a little bit akin to Quetzalcoatl, which is which the is, serpent and the bird married together. Is, is the, Well, it, Quetzalcoatl is the... It's the serpent that flies, that also is the dragon for the Japanese. Mm, this is so cool. So did you know, did any of these cultures ever discover when they said we are from these stars and they point somewhere in the cosmos, do we know who these beings were, what galaxy they came from or what name they call themselves? Well, they think they came, uh, like uh, the Mayans say, they came from the Pleiades. Oh, beautiful. Okay, the seven mm -hmm. sisters. 
so mo- so let's move further on what you're sharing here. So the first Maya ceremony leads to the creation of calendars. What's the significance? After the sun came, after the sun show up. After the, the first sun- ceremony happened when the sun arrived, came. As they were doing the ceremony in the middle of it, there was a light that came from up above. And when this light reached the ground, it manifested an elder. And then they say, he says, who are you? And he said, I am the heart of the heavens. I am the heart of the earth. I am the heart of the water. I am the heart of the air. He says, the land, the earth is yours. He says, populate it. And then he disappeared. Ooh. Ha. There, therein lies the creation for the Mayan culture in the significance of time. And there is particularly this role of Choltun or the long count calendar in marking errors and its relevance to the error. How does that connect that information to what we are living in today? this calendar, where does that set us right now? Okay, we have several calendars, like the hub that has to, it's a solar calendar and has to do more in agriculture. We have the Cholkir, that is uh, uh, that is used more in the daily life. Uh, it's called the spiritual calendar, it's a lunar calendar. And based on that, are the, uh, the ceremonies, the astrology are done. And they guide us in our daily life. Like I said, um, we have that other calendar that uh, nobody talks much about it. And it's the one we are living. This calendar is the one that marks the eras, different eras in time. Like uh, in 1987, it marked the harmonic convergence and everything has started changing from then on because changes are a process. They don't come overnight. It's a process. And most recently we have the shift. Uh, you know, that, um, that famous uh, 2012, <laughs> that when people talk about the world is going to end, yeah. It didn't matter how much the Mayans would try to deny that and bring awareness that it's only a change, the end of a cycle and beginning of another cycle. Mm-hmm. You know, here we are. It's uh, it's called the long count because it has 5,200 years in length. Okay, every time there is an end of a cycle, there is chaos like you know everything yes. they say every certain time the earth comes in disarray and it has to be reorganized again so uh, we think uh, in the shift or the changes many people are afraid of changes but changes are good. The problem is if we are not prepared for it, for them. But changes bring opportunities. Mm-hmm. Okay, this shift mark, marked especially the return of the feminine energy. And when I say feminine, feminine and masculine, I'm referring to the energy, not to men or women, just the energy. And this energy is in everything. And this feminine energy has arrived. And women, women already are depositories of the feminine energy. So that's what the women becomes enhanced. You know, their powers are coming more awakening. Now, if a man is in touch with his feminine energy, they also will be uplifted okay so this is this is what we are saying now the feminine energy um 
that is in uh it is it, here sometimes we don't see it but just look um i went to a shower baby shower my previous shower baby shower has been maybe 30 40 years ago i don't know and then i went to this shower last year my surprise they were about 40 people half of them were men mm. You know, before it was just the mother, not even the father to be was in the shower, only the mother with the friends, with some other ladies. And and this is one big change. Now we see the fathers, you know, taking being closer to their children, sharing the, you know, the care of the children. And we have the uh, paternity leaves. There was never such a thing, you know? And this is this is awesome because it gives a chance of the men to be more involved with the, you know, with the raising of the children. So these are big changes that are happening. And what, about, that the, what about the other side of this? So if women inherently possess feminine energy just because this is what we've been for so long. And as you're saying with these stories, men are starting to come along to be more engaged, more involved, have more re receiving and receptive and more being in touch with their hearts and their emotions and their expression, creativity, all the, some of many feminine aspects. Are there challenges that also come with this? And if so, can you elaborate? What are the challenges? How can women overcome them how can the men overcome them for first of all we have we have feminine and masculine energy and one of the things we have to do is to balance that energy because the energy is on is one it's only one with two faces you know the feminine face and the masculine but we we have both but we need to balance it men and women because for us, it came, the split came with the invasion, when the invasion came, because they brought some, first of all, they were coming, um, the invasion came with religion, came with them. Uh, who the were, others who were, were the invaders you're talking about? Well, they came, uh, uh, we say from Spain, but they were more, they left from Spain, but they were oh, more. Oh, you mean conquistadors? It was European. Uh, do you mean conquistadors? European invasion. That was a little over 500 years ago. Okay. That's when our ancestors buried that seed because they knew what was coming. Mm -hmm. They, when it so saw the, the people, they were lost at sea. And they were going to India, but they ended up in this area. And then they saw that here there was opportunities to be, <clears throat> to make money. You know, there was a lot of gold. There was a lot of things. So they went back to prepare uh, coming back. And that was with the help of the Pope and with the help of the crown of Spain. You know, they, they gave them money and they came, but they came with an intention already. And, uh, and uh, then the church joined them. And the church, and at that time they had been, it was the time of the Inquisition in Spain. They had killed all these women, you know, they say they were witches. They were women of wisdom. <clears throat> but <clears throat> they... Uh, they got rid of them. And then they came here and they tried to do the same. They brought a new language and it was imposed. They brought a religion and it was imposed. They brought the Ten Commandments. That the three first one says, do not kill, do not steal, do not fornicate. And were the three things that they did when they came. So they imposed these things, and women had to have as many children as God wanted, they say. <clears throat> but they needed these hands to work. You know, they built churches. They'll, uh, all those churches were built with the 
hands of the indigenous people. And that's when the, and then they taught to the woman, it had to, women took, uh, lost her place. It uh, became secondary. And then she had to obey the man. She had to accept and she had to keep quiet. And that's what is still, you know, is in many of the communities, you're still under that course, I would say. <clears throat> but things are changing now. They are changing. And I just want to say, there's also some and insanely antiquated practices. For instance, this um, Sunday, I was at a community event and we went around and did some sharing and it was very beautiful, you know, sharing food and, and some intention and prayer and, you know, just a beautiful experience in a beautiful home. And one of the gals who spoke was speaking about the feminine. And she said that apparently in Afghanistan, they have just decreed that any woman who leaves the house cannot speak. She can only speak while at home. And if she- I speaks, heard that too. Yes. So there, there is much still to be done because this is shocking in this day and age. So Elizabeth, this is important, right? Uh, on whatever level, whatever country, because they're all different that we're living in. How can women heal their wounds to grow? What are some of the steps that women can do to begin this very deep healing process? Well, they are still very oppressed. So, but let's talk about all of us, the rest of the world. You know, we are walking with a bundle of wounds in our soul. Uh, we have uh, wounds of rejection, abandonment, uh, you know, uh, you name it, violence and uh, humiliation, everything. <clears throat> so what we need to do is uh, to make an internal trip. Go inward, you know, to feel your wounds, to find them and to be with them. And because only then, when you recognize them, you can digest them. Once you digest them, they go away. But sometimes it's very hard to go back. You don't want to, to recreate that. But it's, it is necessary to do it. And the key is, okay, the key is the forgiveness. If it's too hard, put some compassion on yourself then uh, you forgive you forgive the other, but forgive yourself also. And that is still a little of balance, you know? So to, to bring balance to it, it just uh, gives thanks for the experience and give thanks for the teachings that it left. I can hear. Sorry, are there key <laughs> key teachings that we can impart to our children and our children's children so that we ensure that they grow up with respect for everything, for everyone, with balance, as you say, of this feminine and masculine? What can we do for our children? Well, that's one of the, the challenges of the women because it's in, in the prophecy says, the Maya in the Maya prophecy says the women will govern. Uh, it says the women will change the world. And he says they are not going to mandate. He says they are going to govern not with weapons, but with the heart. So one of the challenges that women have to is we have to heal ourselves. Mm. We have to educate ourselves in order that we can educate our children well. You know, to show them all the things that you just mentioned, to be respectful of the elders, because now 
the young generation don't respect the elders. No. Right. And for those who want to align with what they're hearing you say, they want to align with this prophetic energy, with the shift in the times of what are happening right now and presenting, and there is chaos going on, but they're like, I want to contribute positively to the shift. What can they do? What concretely are their practices? Are there ways of being? Are there things that they can actively participate in, inside or outside? How would we you can, offer it? We can uh, uh, open our hearts to the change. Because, uh, see, allopathic medicine, economics, all are, are in decadence. Okay. Uh, people are turning more into traditional medicine. Yeah. There are other ways of conducting businesses that are coming, like paternity leaves that we talk about for men. You know, this is a different way from the businesses taking a different approach. Now, um, the thing that is coming for the future is a fusion because technology is not going to go away. Technology is going to be here. But spirituality is coming. Mm. Ancestral wisdom is coming. Mm. And it's going to be a joint. Uh, the medicine, mm. you know, that we have the allopathic medicine. But uh, uh, it's going to blend with traditional medicine. And then all that is going to give birth to the new world. To the new human. And the new humans are already here. And it's like you and I and all of us who are listening to me, interested in the words that we are talking about. Mm, beautiful. So the fusion, that's the new world, that's the new humanity. And rather than rejecting technology it's, and because having, see, it's a combo. See, uh, spirituality alone it brings fanatism, and that's not spirituality, mm -hmm. it's fanatism. Mm -hmm. That's a lack of spirituality. But that can conduce you to death. We see all that is happening around, you know, that uh, uh, believing that they are doing it for God, like, you know, you can defend your God and you go and kill. Technology alone, it doesn't work either because it can create things like, like the atomic bomb mm -hmm. that can conduce to death also. But spirituality with technology, spirituality with work is going to bring the new world, the new human. And that's why it's coming in the future. Maybe we won't see it. Yeah. But we are, we do things for our future, for the future generations. Yeah. Because if you can see in a, in a count of 5,200 years, we are in a, only in the 11th year of this cycle. Oh, wow. That's why there is all this turmoil going on. There is resistance. There is the meeting of heaven and hell. There is the meeting of the dark forces with the with the light. Mm -hmm. And all this brings this convoluted world that we are living right now. Mm. If we say, they might say, well, it's like we are going through, we are still in the umbilical cord. And before birth, there is pain. So we are into the pain to give birth to the new world. It's like the night before the day comes, there is darkness. So I'm right there. So let's not lose hope because things are changing. And we can see now that women voices 
matter. Absolutely. And the women voices come with joy. Yeah. How can women, how can we all women, but frankly, I know I know so many men who would support this. How can we redefine what it means for women to lead, to govern without falling into this traditional masculine way of exerting power? What does it mean to use the power of the heart for a woman to lead and govern? govern? Well, I think we are seeing it now in the news. You know what is going on around these days in politics. Now, there are women that um, that they have they are running their lives with that male energy. That's why we see women, uh, you know, involved in so much violence because they're running with an en with a male energy within themselves. So they are not into their feminine energy, they are into a, a masculine energy within. And to make a change, it needs awareness. It's a conscious yeah. change. A very conscious change. You know, I just want to say, it's amazing to listen to you. And you are also paralleling so much of what the Peruvians talk about. They have their own prophecy called the Pachacuti. And that is the a prophecy yes. every 500 years, they say, different timeline than your 5,200 years. But it's very but close. It's very very close. close, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they also say, for them, they say we're in the middle. And it's not a prophecy, it's not a myth. It is real, we are living in it. There is absolute chaos, but the chaos must come before the healing occurs. And one of the many things they predict is the rise of the divine feminine. So it is amazing to me that in so many indigenous cultures, which again, I feel have always had the secret to healing the planet and humanity, that as part of what they say we are in the midst and what is coming is for finally the divine feminine to come back around again. So there is concurrence with what you and your culture are saying around the world as well. Are there other things, Elizabeth, besides the divine feminine that we will be seeing on the horizon as part of the healing of this planet and of our people? What was your, the, the question? Are there other things besides the rise of the divine feminine that are about to come that will be oh, that will be healing the planet and humanity? Is there uh, is the uh, we are moving towards the era of peace and oneness? That's what is and. Uh, you know, but it needs cooperation. I want to say one more thing. The shift, the shift is a jump, like say like a quantum leap to another uh, level of uh, energy vibration. And this was, I saw this very clearly in a cruise uh, done last uh, January, February. You know, uh, after the pandemic that is stopped, all traveling is stopped. So it had passed like five or six years before this other cruise that I participated on. And the whole group, it was totally different, different vibration. It was amazing to see how it moved as a group, as a collective. And they were lawyers and they were doctors. They were all just coming to learn something, you know, again, mm. some of the ancient wisdom. Mm. And then I saw it again this year. I was in India at another uh, gathering that again, it was the first one they did uh, live after six years. And it was totally different 
than the all the previous ones. Mm. So the shift is happening. That's beautiful. I love that. Well, that's a perfect segue talking about a cruise and about travel because you and I are both speaking and presenting aboard the Portals to Ascension Galactic Origins Cruise this December. We're going to the Yucatan. I am very excited. And I would love to know what you're going to be speaking about on the cruise. And I, besides your talks, I want to give a little like nudge, nudge plug for you. Ooh, you also do this astrology. Earthquake. Yes. This right here. Ah, happening. <laughs> so just so folks know what's going on, Elizabeth is in Guatemala. They've had unbelievable rains. And in fact, I told her before the show began not to be concerned. I felt great spirit wanted this message to come out. And then right before we started this interview, whoa, the, the sun came, the rain stopped, but it sounds like there's a little bit of internet interference in this moment. So uh, I'll repeat. There was a big shake here. Ah. <laughs> yeah, because we were talking. And then I say, oh, that is a... <laughs> yes. <laughs> I must have said something of great import. That's hilarious. Well, I would say a message for the men. Yes, please. To not be afraid and to surrender. And for the women to say, I am good enough. I am not a victim anymore. My voice counts. My voice is heard. This is really important. Um, very important. May I ask you when you say for the men to surrender? Because even my head goes a little bit like, hmm, surrender to what? Around what? To love, to the feminine. And we need your support also. It's not a, a, this is not a political movement. Yeah. It's just something that comes from, it's the return of the ancient wisdom. <clears throat> yeah, when I do a, you know, every month I do a full moon fire ceremony and a new moon ceremony. And I invite community to join me so I can guide them through the ceremony because it's, a remarkable time of creation and of letting go. And I always invite the men to come and stand for the women, the men to come because in some lifetime they were women because they came from a woman, uh, because Mother Earth is a woman. There's so much feminine energy everywhere for all of us. And I think there's such, they, men, women, all so important to what is happening right now for the healing of the planet and the people. Uh, and so surrender for the men, for the women to heal, to use our voice, to remember that we are enough, powerful. We are enough. We are both speaking, Elizabeth, on the Portals to Ascension Galactic Origins Cruise in December to the Yucatan. I'm so excited to meet you in person. And I would love you to tell people, what are you speaking about and what are you offering? Ah, uh, what am I talking about? Well, I'm, I think probably I'm talking about the origin, about uh, our prophets. And you're also, aren't you offering some astrology? Tell me about that. You do some astrology? Well, yes. It's one of the things I like because, see, our creator gave us, each one of us, <clears throat> a, a, <clears throat> a destiny. Our destinies are different. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> Sorry. And that is that that destiny is the inheritance that he has given us to make a living. 
Uh, some people are singers. Other people are good for the law. Other people to take care of Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. Others are uh, um, just um, missionaries. <laughs> Although the word is not really, but just to work for the tradition to uh, uh, or teachers. And that's why there was respect because you cannot envy your gift because uh, your gift, it was given by the creator is yours. So I had to respect that. And and this way is that we didn't have, there was no envy. There was no, no judgments, you know, everything worked together. And this is what gave uh, way to the, how you say, the bartering thing. That was in the old ways. You know, you do this, I do this other, we exchange things. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, what astrology does is gives us, show us our purpose in life. Mm. What are the gifts we have been born with and what is our mission in our uh, adult life when you pass the 40 years of age? You know, there is a time that we experience a big change within ourselves. And uh, it's time of reflection, and we say, "Where am I going?" You know, and so it tells you what uh, what your uh, your mission is for that time of life. Mm, mm, mm. I may have to book. And it's based in the in the lunar calendar. Oh, cool! Amazing. Well, you know, when folks want to know more about what you're speaking about on the cruise, go to debbie-dashinger.com slash cruise. It'll take you right to the site. You'll get to see these unbelievable, these very sacred places we're going to. And you can click on Elizabeth's picture and see under her photo exactly what her presentations and offerings are. And I want to talk a little bit here Elizabeth, about the fact that you are bringing us on a land excursion, specifically to do a fire ceremony. I got to tell you, that's the thing I'm the most excited about doing. And I'm going to do a little plug. If you need an assistant during the ceremony, I am right now publicly Thank offering you. myself you, to you because it would be, ah, uh, it would, I can't even imagine how transformative. Would be my pleasure. Yes, I would love that. So you are offering a Costa Maya excursion where you're leading a Mayan fire ceremony. Ah, can you tell us about that? What can we expect? Well, during, during uh, at some point during the cruise, I will explain uh, before, I like to explain everything about the ceremony in what, uh, in what does it consist or, or, or uh, explaining every, meaning of everything that we use and what a ceremony is. And this is previous so that when we do the actual ceremony, we we already, we can get more connected to it instead of explaining at the moment what this is. You know, that way we can really get more into ourselves and more a better connection with our creator because the ceremonies are done for our creator. We don't have anything else to offer them, you know, but our thoughts, our, our heart is what we offer. And we use like uh, all uh, incense and flowers, think that they can please our creator. For folks who are listening to you, maybe they're new to you, maybe they know you and they're just so excited to see you again. Is there a place that they can go to learn more about you or is there an adventure doing or should they just go to the Galactic Origins cruise and join us so they can meet you in person and experience you in person? I will be happy to meet all of you with much love. <laughs> well, I can't We are wait. living very exciting times. We say we are living times of confusion, that the world is in chaos, but there is a it's time of miracles as well. 
So let's not focus on the other thing, but in the to go forward and the light. In the light, in the light. Elizabeth, this is Dare to Dream. What do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? My personal, I need to have some time for myself. And this is what I'm struggling with because I want to, I feel that all my personal life needs to take attention also. And I find very little time for that, but that is my dream, you know, to, to have more time for myself. And um, also, I wish um, for all of us to dream, to dream a world of beauty, health, and peace. Aho. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. And thank you for the amazing work you're doing. And I really hold the intention for you that as much beautiful, loving, peaceful, healing energy, Elizabeth, that you put out in the world, that you receive back just as much that you can contribute to yourself. So you have even more for all that you're giving. Well, thank you for your thoughts and thank you for the opportunity to be here at this moment. Again, folks, if you would like to meet Elizabeth and experience the profound work and messages she has, if you'd like to meet me in person and all I'll be speaking about aboard the cruise and the many other incredible presenters, plus our land excursion. Be ready to give you a big hug to everyone. <laughs> And that comes too with the cruise is hugs and you'll break bread with us. We'll have meals together. There's just so much to do. Go to debbie-inger.com slash cruise and sign up today. You can learn more at that site. And I end today's show with this quote from Grandmother Flor de Mayo. What exists in us as women is that we yearn for possibilities. We yearn to have freedom. We yearn to have the capacity to express ourselves in total freedom. This is why there's such a huge migration going on around the globe. People are moving and it is the spirit of the feminine that is moving us. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow, subscribe, leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or YouTube. Your support helps more people discover the show, and it means the world to me. Thank you. Next week on Dare to Dream, I am once again speaking with the amazing Tim Tactics, who is known for his cosmic disclosure on Gaia TV and his appearances on Truth Hunter. Remember this week to stay in peace rather than pieces. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.